Welcome back to the Chosen Life Podcast. I'm your host, the Chosen Lawyer, Jonathan A. Cohen, author of The Bible 3.0, The Six Commandments of the Chosen Life, available now as audiobook on Audible, Indigo, and wherever you find your books, including Barnes & Noble. And my co-host today, back for another week, he's our sports guru, the man with the magical predictions and the magical sports cards and memorabilia, the one and only Wayne Fraser Jr., of Doug Lurie Sports. Wayne, welcome back to The Chosen Life. Good to be here again, Jonathan, and uh, ready to talk some, I think we have some pretty spicy topics, so. We do, and over the course of the next few weeks, we're going to be going uh, all sorts of directions. Today, we're talking about the upcoming NFL Draft, which starts off on Thursday, April 25th, so this week. And of course, we only care about day one, and of course, we only care about the first five picks. But before we get to today's major topic, I have some sub items here. We got to clean up some housekeeping uh, because a lot's been going on in the general world of sports and memorabilia. So I uh, needed your take on a couple items with your permission, Wayne. Sure. Go right ahead. Numero uno. We'll go with uh, predictions gone right, predictions gone wrong. So a Wayne prediction that went very, very right this past uh, few weeks. You called it on the Wayne Gretzky unopened uh, case of cards. You indicated in one of our episodes that I uh, think the person overpaid for it. Pretty sure they're going to have remorse over it and don't know what they really think they're going to do with it. Uh, I break apart that case. Don't know if I'm going I'm to make money on it. Well, it turns out, Wayne, that the buyer... Uh, made most of the payments for the cards, had one more big payment to go and said, yeah, you know what? I don't think I enjoyed as much, you know, talking to the second bidder and hearing how much it meant to them. Doesn't mean that much to me. So, uh, you know, I feel like, yeah, I, I regret this and uh, I, I don't want these anymore. So maybe they can just keep it for me for safekeeping and let's resell it. Uh, what is your take now on this Opichi barnyard find and uh has your opinion changed at all my opinion hasn't changed um after reading a little bit about the gentleman who was i believe in alberta or saskatchewan or something like that who bought them um yeah i think he thought he was going to immediately get an offer from somebody else that was going to make him 500 grand or a million dollars or something and when that didn't happen, suddenly now, well, I'm not so interested and blah, blah, blah. Uh, this is sort of a weird situation. There seems to be, and, and you know, far be it from me to say that I'm an expert in $3 million auction sales, but there seem to be a lot of people who are wondering why it is, you know, why is this being sold to somebody who apparently didn't have all the money to put up at, at when the sale was over with, because I would assume there's really only one of two options here. Uh, Golden Auctions has made the consigner whole already, and now they're dealing with the aftermath of it, or the consigner hasn't gotten all of their money yet. Um, in either one of those cases, it's not particularly awesome, especially for the auction house. It makes the auction house look a little weak. Um, you know, it's possible that there was some discussion about this beforehand between the buyer and the auction house that look, I'm immediate. I'm just buying this to flip this and I'm immediately going to relist it. But if that were the case, this is a pretty weak way to go about it. You know, it would be much better for the buyer to say, you know, something else has come up and I need the liquidity and we're going to give people another shot at this because doing it this way, it, to, it in my eyes, it devalues the product. You know, your top bidder backs out of it. You know, if they resell this, what does it sell for? It maybe sells for $3 million, Maybe it sells a little less. Or you never know. Two other guys jump in there that decide they, you know what, I should have been bidding on this in the first place. And it does go for $4 million, And the guy makes a little bit of money. The question is, he's paid a bunch of the money, but he hasn't paid all of it. If it sells for more, does he get the cut of the overage? Or is he out of the deal now? And basically, they just say, here's your money back on this. And now the auction house makes the rest of the money, right? Uh, I, I'm not not particularly surprised about it, though, because I thought it went for more than it should have. And I think maybe this guy who 
has been described as a real estate investor. Um, a realtor. Just, I think it was a realtor. Real uh, yeah, and, real and, and got caught up in the you know excitement of the bidding and that night. And he either doesn't have the money or he's realized I'm just not going to make any money on this. And now it's time to move on. It's, you know, you're making me think so many thoughts, Wayne, you know, and sometimes as, as you tell me your descriptions, all of a sudden my brain goes in different directions. But, you know, as a real estate lawyer with uh, Corman's LLP, I've heard the story so many times. Imagine this way, and you go to put an offer on a house and you find out, oh, there was a previous offer on, a, on this house two weeks ago and they had a bunch of conditions and they didn't waive their conditions and the deal fell through and now it's back on the market. Would that change your perspective, Wayne, when you go to put an offer on the house versus a house that just got listed on the market? I yeah, would say for yes. Sure. Yeah, yeah, I, that actually similar situation happened. My wife's, uh, my grandmother-in-law, uh, she had a house close down to, we're going to do a little inside baseball here, close down to the shops of Don Mills um, that she had been living in since 1946. And the it was on a double piece of property and it sold for, close to $2 million. This was about six years ago, five, six years ago. And the original buyer, for some reason, couldn't come up with the money. And so, you know, the family was kind of like, wow, I don't, you know, this, what happens here? And the realtor was like, don't worry about it. And it turned out that it sold for $100,000 more. They went back to the other bidders and said, you've got one shot to put a number in an envelope. And so that does happen. I mean, it's possible you could get two or three people who are just going to decide Hey, I wasn't in on it the first time around and I'm all hyped up on Red Bull or whatever New York investment bankers use to get hyped up. Um but I'll throw and, it to you but I'll throw it to you another spectrum because mm -hmm. there's one thing when it's conditional and they didn't waive their condition. Another thing is deals firm and you come time for the closing date and you put down your deposit, maybe you put down a second deposit and you tell the uh seller on closing, "Hey, I can't get my financing. I can't come up with a down payment. I got to walk away from this thing. And now the seller is left with having to hold the bag, needs to relist the property, needs to resell the property, figure out their damages, and then go back and sue the original buyer. This is more the scenario of what we're talking about here. And the advice usually to the, bu to the buyer, the first buyer, if you can find a way, borrow from the mom, the bank of mom and dad, get a second mortgage, what private mortgage, whatever you got to do, you close, even rent out the property for a year, then go to resell the property a year later or live in the property for a year, whatever you got to do. But maybe the market will change. Maybe you're going to make even more money. But if you get sued, uh, not the best yeah. thing. And your damages can be pretty substantial. So this person figures he made most of the payments. You know, what's the big deal? I just have one more big payment here. So it's not like he didn't he only pay like 10,000 of it. He paid a lot of it. But he's thinking, you know, uh, just hold on to it for safekeeping. Let me decide what I'm going to do. It doesn't work that way. You know, a deal is a deal. There's a timeline to it. And the auction says, we're not a safety storage for clients. They have X amount of time that they need to actually pick up their goods. You know, okay, this is not I, I agree with that. But I think in this situation, one, if you're the fellow who bought the stuff, I would think it would be pretty easy for you to go to pretty much any bank. I believe the outstanding amount is $750,000. I think that's what they said was owing yeah. on it to get a loan for that. And then when it sells, take the, you know, out of the proceeds, you get the bank gets their money back or whatever. That's a pretty sure thing, I would think. <laughs> Excuse me. I, I wouldn't be so sure that this is disadvantageous to the auction house. I, I think from a, a standpoint of future consignments, people may look at it a little strangely. But from the auction houses uh, standpoint, you know, they, a lot of times auction houses for large things like this will give even the buyer, let's say that there's a 22% buyer premium. I think that's what it was in this auction, right? So it sells for 3 million and then there's another 660,000 buyers premium or whatever. Right? They may even give the original owner, the consigner, a chunk of that, right? But if they've gotten in, $3 million at this point and the, the prospective buyer, the actual buyer has to back out <laughs> to a certain extent. Golden's is more than happy to put that back up again. Cause they're just going to get another fee, right. To rerun it again. Right. It, it's a huge pain in the butt. If you're talking about, I run auctions and somebody doesn't pay for something that's $150. Okay. 
now, okay, how long do I have to hold on to it? How much do I want to chase this person around? Or do I just want to say, forget it and relist the item, right? If you're talking about something that's going to get, that's going to net you $250,000 to $500,000 in terms of a fee, plus the added attraction, again, of it being in another auction and being the feature of another auction, even if it doesn't do as well, I think the only person who really loses here is the dude who bought it in the first place. What did he pay originally, Wayne? I think it was 3.7 is what it worked out to with the with the buyer's fee. So that's around 3.1 3 million plus the, the hammer fee. So think about this. They go to resell it right away for the guy, right? And obviously when, the, when it sells, he's not seeing a penny until they get back all the money from when he first purchased. Plus they're going to take all the commissions and everything else. He's only going to see the money at the end. So they can't lose. Like you're saying, unless the thing literally sells for 600,000, which it won't. Right. No, I don't think, I don't think golden auctions has any, any financial risk here. It just looks, it's, it's a bad look, unfortunately. Right. Here's what he thought he was going to do, which also real estate investors do as well. So this is funny how it's all parallel to real estate. When you have this kind of value of a good, whether it's Wayne Gretzky rookie cards in an unopened box or you have a Babe Ruth jersey, it becomes almost like a piece of real estate, essentially. He had approached a bunch of people, whether it's the Maple Leafs, it's the Edmonton Oilers, it's Wayne Gretzky himself. And he tried to get it flipped thinking he's going to be an intermediary. And so he's basically buying it, selling it under assignment. So the real buyer is going to come along, pay him an even bigger premium. And so he's going to cash in without having to put in his own money and realize, oh, crap, I can't flip it this quickly and call with his pants down. Because I, I guess from what the way I read it that way, he can say, oh, I feel bad. I don't have the passion for it. BS. I, the, way, the way he describes it, he was trying to flip it from day one and, and he got his hand caught in the cookie jar and didn't work out. You know, remember the guy that had the Aaron Judge uh, home run ball and, you know, had a big offer for it and said, no, no, I want to see where it does at auction. And he only got a fraction of the money at the end. Right. Greed, 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 greed. You know, even the person who gave away the home run ball for Otani, the first Dodgers ball, and then came back afterwards and says, you know, I wanted to make sure he got the ball, but I felt pressured and, you know, uh, I regret doing it now. Greed, it's a funny thing the next morning when you wake up. When you're in the heat of the moment, it's very easy to feel one way. And then all of a sudden, when you, all of a sudden, dollar signs are racing around in your head. But my point is, inevitably, I find whether it's real estate, whether it's sports cards, whether it's selling a car, your first offer is generally your best offer. And right. People got to remember that. Yeah, I because agree with that. Yeah, if, all those, if all those people wanted, if Wayne Gretzky wanted those cards, if uh, the Toronto Maple Leafs, the Hockey Hall of Fame wanted those cards, they would have bought it originally. And that's that's kind of my point about, you know, you're buying this to flip it. How are you possibly going to reach more people than Golden Auctions did? I mean, this was on every news, uh, you know, news uh, channel, every newspaper. It was everywhere. People were everywhere. talking about this. It's not like you're suddenly going to turn up some guy in the Himalayas who goes, oh, man, I didn't even see that auction. I'll give you five million, right? And I'm seriously, even if you thought, I, I wrote a column a long time ago when the Barry Bonds ball uh, was caught, right? And I, um, you and didn't my, catch it, right? Uh, no, I didn't, unfortunately. Um, I wrote a column, basically like a one-act play, about the gentleman who caught the ball going to Major League Baseball and proposing that instead of him auctioning the ball or whatever else, that they hire him for a million dollars or two million dollars and build a road show, and then at the end of the the year or whatever, the ball would be turned over to Barry Bonds or to the Hall of Fame or whatever else. And the people were like, why would we pay you a million dollars? And he's like, because you're going to get $10 million worth of publicity out of this and goodwill and everything else. And I guarantee you some company is going to underwrite this, whether it be you know PNC Bank or whoever it is, right? I suspect that maybe that's what was happening here too was this guy thought, you know what, even if I don't make any money on this, I'm going to get my name out there as a big wheeler dealer. And then maybe I can jump in and be a broker in these deals. Maybe it gets me more deals. And that's not a bad way to think, but man alive, did you pick the wrong time to pay at the top of the market? I mean, the market has come way back from a year or two ago, right? We've had this discussion, I think about the fellow who bought fanatics, 
you know, and spent $600 million on tops or whatever the number was. And he's doing all this stuff. And it's like, well, buddy, you bought in at the absolute top of the market. And now you, you may be waiting for a long time for the market to rise that much again, where you might make some money. So I, I, I think if it is resold, I think it will go in the, maybe a $3 million flat range. And maybe this guy, depending on how they work things, I'm sure whatever the difference is, this guy's going to lose it. Right. But his name is also, but his name is also mud now on in yeah. the media. So yeah, it doesn't look great. If you're, if you're in the area and you want to make a real estate deal, this guy's probably not going to be your first phone call anymore. Nope, nope, nope. And with your permission, next week, I actually, it's, it, I've been waiting for a week to talk to you about Fanatics because I've been very curious about that company. But let's talk about Fanatics next week because we got a couple more items before we get to the NFL draft. Speaking of the NFL, so we talked about predictions gone right, predictions gone wrong. So a few people on social media reached out to us and talked about the episode where you were mentioning when was the last high draft quarterback that switched teams that succeeded? Okay. We got a list for you that people over the course of several comments put together. I will name them off for you. And then I'm curious on your take on how you projected it and the names that they put in. You ready? Because people okay. were on this. Manning, Favre, Brady, Stafford, Goff, Jim Plunkett. They, so they came up with Jim Plunkett out of the sky, which was great. I had to look him up. Baker Mayfield, Michael Vick. Drew Brees, Geno Smith, Ryan Tannehill, Trent Dilfer, Steve Young, and Alex Smith. I did correct them that Brady was not a high draft pick. I think that they were asleep on the wheel in that one. But what do you think of all those names, Wayne? And um, shows you people are watching and paying attention. That list is almost completely wrong. Um, I don't care if somebody switches, you know, after they're an established quarterback or before they play for a team. And Manning's, you know, if you're going to say it's because he switched teams at the draft, irrelevant. If you're going to say he switched teams after 16 years in the league, not what we were talking about. What I'm talking about is somebody in the situation of Justin Fields, Kenny Pickett, and I, I think it was pretty clear. I, and I don't disagree. I mean, technically, if you're going to say Geno Smith, I mean, the guy was in the league for seven years before he became a starter, six, seven years, right? Um most of those, I think just about everybody that you named there were guys who had long runs, right? And then went to another team and had success, right? Uh, Brett Favre is an exception. Um, that's a special case because for some reason, the coaching staff in Atlanta absolutely hated his guts, right? And that, but that I will say that's, I'll allow that one. That's true. He was a second round pick late first um uh, it was it was not a first overall no 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 and and um you know the other ones were all guys you know plunkett actually is a good call too plunkett is um but that was a situation where the again like a justin field situation where the team was so absolutely atrocious that when he went to somewhere when he went to the raiders how could he be anything but better than what they had there right I'd also argue Baker Mayfield and Geno Smith. Yeah, they were around, but they were journeymen at best until they really thrived. All these other guys, for the most part, were freaking stars and studs by the time they went off to their next team. So I, I, I got you. I got you. That's a very like good I would point. even say I would even say with Baker Mayfield, I mean, that's 2018, right? And Romeo. he played and played at a relatively high level. I mean, people want to say Mayor Mayfield was terrible. He wasn't terrible. He was a middle-of-the-road quarterback. He was pretty good. He just never got over the hump until he got to Tampa Bay, right? But again, you know, okay, I will allow, I, I would say okay to that one to a certain extent, but he was certainly not a bust. You know, Jared Goff was not a bust. And it, how long was Jared Goff where he was until he went to somewhere else, right? Stafford, same thing. I mean, he played yeah. on a lot of crappy when teams. We're talking, but when we're talking about guys like, you know, like Pickett, Fields, Trey Lance, you know, guys like that who got two or three years and were just absolute garbage. Not garbage. Or, or, you know or, bench, I mean. or, bench, or bench fillers. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's very unusual that 
if there's, I think the whole point of that discussion was if you're taken at the very top of the draft and then you, within two or three years, you go somewhere else, you're not being moved because they think you're wonderful. If, you know, they, they are being moved because they think after two or three years, we were so far off in drafting you that it's just, we just, we got to get rid of you and start over again. Right. So the chances of that guy becoming a big star somewhere else are slim to none. You know, Favre, Favre was a high pick. I mean, I'm not going to, he's not top five or anything like that, but I mean, I would say even like first rounders, there are very few of them that, you know, you can come up with first, second round quarterbacks who within a couple of years were moved and then became stars somewhere else, became big names. Speaking of the world, but, of baseball, but but I do appreciate all the comments. I do as well, and uh, they were very passionate about it as well. So we appreciate the passion. Speaking of high draft picks that needed to move around in order to really uh, find their zone and their own in the world of sports, Trevor Bauer. Let's uh, touch upon him very quickly because he was just very very recently the news yet again. So uh, speaking with Kareem Garcia about it over on the Chosen Journey, the Chosen Baseball Journey. Uh, former LB player Kareem Garcia talked about how uh, he was signed. Uh, Trevor Bauer was signed to a Mexican uh, league contract, pitched against uh, an exhibition games, including against the Yankees, pitched very, very well. He's playing on a team with Robinson Cano and then signs a five game deal in the Mexican league. And during this time, Trevor Bauer then goes on social media, posts another video. I found it fascinating, Wayne. So talking about one of the uh, ladies, uh, use that term loosely, who, uh, has now been uh, indicted by a grand jury in Arizona on felony charges of fraud scheme and theft by extortion. So uh, after all this time and all the evidence and everything that went around on the Trevor Bauer story, the, my understanding from the legal system, I'm not an American lawyer, so I can't speak that uh, on that, but grand juries don't just indict you unless they have a bunch of stuff on you. And so Trevor Bauer went on social media, talked about that case extensively and it's not just him. It's another uh, gentleman who uh, who was the victim in this case with this person. She's facing, I believe, up to 16 years in prison. Now looking at the Trevor Bauer situation after everything went down, this was, I believe, the initial person who put in the complaint. Now she's getting indicted for fraud charges. My estimation, I think Trevor Bauer is looking a lot more like roses now. And MLB with their collusion, because make no mistake about it, Wayne, 30 teams where every single pitcher pretty much either has an elbow issue or has a lat issue. The injured list is filling up like fine wine. Uh, Spencer Strider goes down, Senga's down, Verlander's coming back, you know, Scherzer's supposed to come back, DeGrom is out. And all the Major League Baseball and all the pitcher injuries, a potential Cy Young-type candidate who can be had at, the, at a minimum salary, not... 30 million, not 20 million, not 10 million, not 5 million. Uh, I think teams are going to be relooking at Trevor Bauer again. What is your take or hot take on Trevor Bauer? I think teams are going to look at him again, and I don't think he's going to play in the major leagues this year. Um, I, I, I think that because I have been a proponent of Bauer's innocence in this instance for quite a long time. In fact, I just had a long discussion about this a week or two ago that I believe Trevor Bauer and what Trevor Bauer said. However, there is the truth and there is the court of public opinion and a team to say, you know, I'm going to, let's say it's the Blue Jays. The Blue Jays are going to sign Trevor Bauer. Okay. They're going to face immediate backlash from all different, all sides saying, how could you sign this guy? He's this, he's that. Whether it's true or not, they're going to have to deal with that. The other problem is Trevor Bauer has kind of been known to be a jerk and a bad teammate for some period, right? Now, can you deal with bad teammates and jerks? Sure, the Oakland A's won three World Series in a row in the early 70s with a teammate full of people, a, a, a clubhouse full of people who wanted to beat the crap out of each other in a lot of instances. It can be done. Remember Jose Canseco? Yeah. Yeah, well, that's even earlier. I'm talking Reggie Jackson, Billy Martin, 
you know, that kind of stuff. Right. Yes, yes. But a hundred percent, right. It can happen with, you know, with a bad teammate or, or a, a bad clubhouse or whatever, it's still, it can still happen. But we're talking about a different era now, right? We're talking about people being my, my fifis are hurt if you sign this guy because I don't like him and blah, 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 blah. And look, I don't wish what happened to Trevor Bauer or what I believe happened to Trevor Bauer in this instance on to anybody. Maybe stop whoring around. Maybe be a little more judicious with where you, uh, you know, something about one of your appendages and crazy. Maybe don't put yourself in these situations. And Bauer was pretty upfront and pretty candid about, oh, you know, look at me. I'm out with these chicks and blah, 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 blah. Now maybe we know why a couple of them got with you. It wasn't because you were a star pitcher or you're so good looking or amazing in bed. It's because they wanted to take advantage of you, and they did. They did take advantage of you. And even if she ends up in jail, ruined his career. You know, I mean, this is a guy who top five pitcher in baseball for how many years? Arguably the best pitcher in baseball for a couple of years. And you're in the Mexican League playing with Robin Con Robinson Cano on a five-game contract, right? I don't believe that a, a, an MLB team, there might be one or two of them at the end of the season who might be so desperate that they say, we're going to take this on. But there are going to be an awful lot of guys in that clubhouse, and I hate to tell you this, there are an awful lot of guys in the clubhouses in Major League Baseball who are going to look at Trevor Bauer and go, not interested in having him as a teammate. Um, whether uh, that's the right call or the wrong call, it's a matter of whether you believe in chemistry and whether you believe in the overall well-being of the of the clubhouse. But I also just think from an, a, a standpoint of optics and the way the world works right now, I don't think he's coming back. Deshaun Watson got a contract and a pretty nice contract. Um, Antonio Brown got second and third chances, even, you know, with Tom Where, Brady. Where'd right? that happen? Where'd that happen? Right. Okay. Domingo Herman, Domingo Herman, go look up his, uh, legal mm -hmm. troubles and he was convicted and yet he still got a contract in MLB this year. And for MLB that believes that the stands are filled with Ken and Karen's and that's it. If they go look on social media every time Trevor Bauer talks about this and read the comments from the fans, let's say there's 30,000 comments. Wayne, I'll tell you, 29,000 of them are saying, free Bauer, bring back Bauer. Why is he not on my team? We could sure use him right now. And I like the approach of what Bauer has come out and said in the last few weeks and months versus, let's say, Pete Rose, for example. Pete Rose, I always argued, if Pete Rose had come out from day one and said, I have an illness. I have a gambling problem. Help me, help me help myself. And went to rehab and came back and said, I have been in rehab for months, years, and I'm rehabilitated and I see the errors in my way and I'm gonna be giving to charities and I'm gonna be speaking to children on the dangers of gambling. If he had done this over the course of 10, 15 years, he rose to be in the hall of fame right now. Instead of him you. going to Vegas and signing autographs saying, I bet on baseball you know, and laughing and putting it in baseball's face. Trevor Bauer came back and has said, I made really bad life decisions. I was a young man and I was stupid. A lot of young men are very stupid. A lot of young women are pretty stupid. And they do things in their, when they're early teens and early adulthood and, you know, up to the age of 25, 27, 30. And a lot of people have been there. It's what you do with that afterwards, that one or two bad decisions is that this decide your whole life. And he says, I'm really watching on who I'm with now and I don't go and have casual relationships anymore. And I'm going to be very smart about it. He recognizes it, puts that out there. And I think that should help a lot and seeing what has happened to the people around him who accused him. But I think ultimately when it comes down to what you were saying, they remember the drone incident and they remember all those snide comments he made to the media and on social media and everything else. And I'm thinking at the end of the day, if he does not ever get a contract and he never does come back to MLB and he puts through through the union a collusion claim. I mean, this union is in shambles as we speak right now, regardless. But I would say legally, there's no effing way based on his talent, based on the fact that he was cleared 
that this guy should not at least have an attack. Domingo Herman is a freaking MLB. Trevor Bauer, a thousand percent. And if he had a collusion case, and you think about how much, never mind how much money he's lost, but pending the whole trial and uh, the uh, investigation, and everything else, and he got suspended still, and he still got his name cleared. But now MLB is an employer, and all these thirty teams, and making the decision, oh, we're going to shy away from this person. I think he has a decent collusion case and the guy's losing tens of millions of dollars every single year by being left out. I think they're smarter to bring him in, bring him in on a minimum contract. And if people think he's going to blow his brains out on the mound and not be the talent he is, at least they could say, aha, I told you so. But if that guy goes off and he's also an injury free guy for the most part later in his career, and he has a two year A and a one whip, uh, you're going to the playoffs because you got this guy in your rotation. I 100% disagree that he would have a collusion claim. And it's because this is not an instance where the all owners all get together and say, don't hire this guy. It only takes one dude to jump up and say, I'm going to sign him, right? It's a question of, is there one guy out there who is willing to bring this guy in? This is a character thing. This is not, we're trying to hold salaries down. And, and uh, to me, it actually works the other way for MLB, for for the league, for them to say, "Look, I I, I disagree with it." To in that instance, I, I in that in that situation, if you want to say, "I'm not going to bring Trevor Bauer in because this woman made this accusation, which has now pretty much been disproven," yeah, that's that's it. You shouldn't be doing that, right? But if you want to say, "I can't." bring Trevor Bauer in because of the previous decisions he's made and the previous actions he's taken being a jerk in clubhouses in major league baseball and thinking if something doesn't go right with Trevor Bauer, he's going to turn on the team immediately and be an a-hole to the team. That's a hundred percent a legitimate reason not to bring somebody in. And I don't care who it is. Okay. I'll give you one team, one team that has Nothing to lose, literally, and have the worst reputation and the worst owners. How about the Oakland A's? Oakland A's. Yeah, Oakland that's, A's. Exactly, that's exactly the one team I can tell you that might take a chance on them. You're sitting on a team where, what, they got 500 people in the stands, and you are moving next year to Sacramento just because you can't sit in the stadium anymore. It is such an effing disaster. They know the team's getting relocated to Vegas. You want to take some attention off of you? Go put Trevor Bauer in there immediately. They're a team that doesn't care whatsoever what their fan base thinks clearly. So that could only be a positive for them. If the Oakland A's can't even sign him, I'm going to ask you, Wayne, you don't think that in GM meetings, they're not saying all 30 of them, but owners didn't sit and talk to each other. GMs didn't sit and talk to each other and say, hey, are you thinking about Bauer? Are you thinking about Bauer? I wouldn't do it. You know what? Neither would I. You don't think those they've had those talks? Oh, I 100% assure you they've had those talks. That's not collusion. That's a discussion. Collusion is when you make an, a concerted effort to get everybody together to come to the same thing. I don't think there's anybody in Major League Baseball. Now, let's say that Rob Manfred made it, you know, made it clear to everybody, I don't want Bauer, you know, in back in baseball and then you were able to find some sort of trace of that. Sure, that's collusion or that's whatever. But I think that these, I don't think these owners are going to act, you know, somebody's not going to jump up and think, wow, you know, and that's why I say come August 1st or August 15th, maybe somebody will step out and say, you know what, I don't care about what the possibilities of this are. But I think especially at this point in the season, I don't think anybody's willing to take that risk. And I don't think it's collusion. I think it's self-preservation. Last question then on this from your end, because uh, I like your point there and I found it interesting. You don't think any team owners, GMs, talk to Manfred about Bauer and ask him for his take, and will they get the blessing of MLB? I don't think it takes the blessing of MLB to sign the player. I um, do I think somebody may have asked Manfred? Yeah. Are you going to find any trace of that? No. How, out of 30 teams, how many t team representatives at some point have talked to Manfred about it, would you guess? Maybe just a couple. I would say maybe just a couple because here's the thing. It doesn't take that many people to talk about it to Manfred. If Manfred's word is, I really do not want Trevor Bauer back in the league. I don't want to have to deal with it. It would only take him saying that to one or two team representatives before it filtered to everybody else. However, 
I also think that there would be forces sympathetic enough to Trevor Bauer in the major league offices or in the front office of some team that if that were the case, it would have leaked out already. Well, I'm looking at my crystal ball because I'm feeling very passionate about it and realizing on how dire straits the Oakland A situation is and how much you need to have the the wall, you need to have the Trojan horse, and you need something to distract people from attention to everything else that's blowing up around you. The Oakland A's, this is their solution. If you want to have any way to get any attention off you and in any kind of direction whatsoever, Trevor Bauer is going to do it for you. So mark my words, we're sitting here in April by June 1st, Trevor Bauer will be in Oakland A. There's my new prediction. Okay. You can take that one to the bank. So, taken to the bank in actual today's episode, we covered off a lot of housekeeping items because we ha- that's how we roll sometimes. Uh, Wayne, we got the NFL draft this week. Uh, let's be honest about it. All we care about is quarterbacks and appearing from all the psychics that the first five picks are going to be quarterbacks as usual. So, One is going to be a superstar. One is going to be really, really great. One is going to be good. And two are going to stink from the top five that are going to be drafted. Wayne, let's go one by one and let's hear how you see they're going to roll. So, uh, of course, we'll start off with number one. Bears taking Caleb Williams. That's a no doubter. I think Caleb Williams has pretty much all the physical tools you want in a quarterback. And I don't see him as markedly different than Justin Fields. Um, I understand why they're taking him. I don't think he'll be the most successful quarterback in the draft. I think he'll be a good quarterback. I don't think he's going to be, you know, he's not Lamar Jackson. He's not, you know, I think he's a guy that probably should will be the third or fourth most effective quarterback out of this draft. How long will it take till Caleb Williams is not playing for Chicago? Five years? Three. Three. Yeah. I mean, I I don't want to say, and and they, he's in a much better situation than Fields was because that team was not only absolute garbage on the field, but the coaching staff was terrible too, right? Williams is in a much better situation. I've seen it referred to that they built him a nest. And I don't think he's going to be horrible. I think he's pretty good. But I also, you know, here's a guy who has been basically coddled since he was 10 years old. He's had sports guy psychologists. He's had trainers. His parents built him a facility, basically, which they now run with some of these other people. Um, I don't know whether that guy is, you know, is he ready to step in and be the guy day one when he comes out, I I just don't think so. I understand he has to go number one overall. Uh, he's he is the best, at least in terms of he's the least least problematic of any of the guys you have. There's the 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 issue with Caleb Williams to me is he said he didn't want to be in Chicago first off, you know, and then oh I didn't mean that I didn't mean that right, and then. He's made a bunch of money in the NIL deals already too, right? And he doesn't come from a background like, you know, somebody like C.J. Stroud, who basically C.J. Stroud built himself, right? That guy's tough enough to go right right off the bat. Is Williams ready to do that? Eh, I don't know. I, I, I understand that if it was me, I would trade the pick. I mean, again. If, if, if you had Justin Fields and what you can get for that pick, uh, I would have done the same thing. I yeah. wouldn't have drafted him either, but uh... look, and I get I get why they traded Fields because if they no matter what happens, this year is the last year of his of his uh, rookie contract. Next year they're going to have to give him a ridiculous amount of money if he stays there. So I understand moving him along. What I don't understand is why would you not go out and get Russell Wilson? Why would you not go out and get Drew Locke? Why would you not go get uh, Daniel? Maybe try to make a deal for Daniel Jones or somebody like that. Jake Jacoby Brissett, you know, Mac Jones, what, you know, play that guy, play that guy for a year, trade this pick. And you know what? You could probably trade this pick to maybe Minnesota and get Minnesota's both their first rounders this year and a pick next year. I mean, for what you got last year for the number one, you're going to get quite a bit more than that because so many people want Williams you might get two firsts this year from Minnesota and another first next year. 
and then you slide down to fifth and you still get McCarthy, Daniels, Drake May, one of those guys, right? Is we'll, that we'll, we'll get to we'll get to the Vikings. Uh every every procrastinator uh, procrastinator out there had that uh Vikings are trading up and we know who they're taking, but let's go to number 2 now and reading about the Commanders and I I read a couple articles where they were convinced that the Commanders were going to trade their pick and make some sort of convoluted deals with uh, the Patriots as well, and that the Commanders were going to end up with Jared Goff. So that's obviously not happening and not really seeing why Detroit would do that and thinking that Detroit wants McCarthy. But it looks like the Commanders at number two are taking Drake May. So reading about him a little bit, he looks like a poster child quarterback. It looks like exactly what you want on your Wheaties box. It looks like what you want outside your stadium. Uh, he looks the part, you know, as far as his build and height and everything else. Probably has good hand size, uh, so a lot of teams would want to draft him. Uh, what is your take on him, and you think he'll be doing well for the Commanders? I think May is probably the second most, third most physically gifted quarterback in the, in the draft. Is he ready to start right now? He absolutely is not ready to start right now. Um, he's only, he's coming out after his sophomore year. Um, he has a long pedigree. His family, his dad was a quarterback and played in the WFAL. His brother was a quarterback at the collegiate level. He has a, you know, he has the, the pedigree, but I don't think he's anywhere near ready. And, and I, the drafts I've been seeing now are saying may, but up until a week ago, it was Jaden Daniels for the commanders. Right. So I think that lends a little bit of credence that is it possible that the commanders, Chicago takes William one and now Williams one. And now the commanders say, well, it's either may or Daniels. Why don't we trade the number two pick? Let somebody else take, make the decision for us. They're probably going to trade Drake may. And then if they move down to fourth or fifth, they're probably still going to get Jaden Daniels and pick up an extra couple of picks. Right. I think May, again, like you said, he looks the part, although the other thing I have heard about him is he is a, a seemingly very quiet sort of aw shucks, not fiery guy. And I know that some teams are just like, uh, I need my quarterback to be a little more gung ho. Right. Um, I, again, I think he has a ton of talent, but he's a guy who needs to sit for a year or two and Washington's not in that situation. If they're willing to eat it for a year or just say, you're going to be a dump off quarterback or you're going to learn for a year. But if you're, if you're taking him to start and six, <clears throat> excuse me, succeed this year, it's probably not the right call. So prediction wise so far, we, we agree. Uh -huh. Williams is going number one. Do you see may going number two to the commanders? If they keep the pick. Yes. Um, if they trade the pick, I don't know that the team that would be trading for the second pick might not take Jalen Daniels there. He was number two for quite a while. Right. So, and this all kind of hinges on what happens with the third pick and the Patriots too. Right. And this is where we get to the third pick where apparently the Patriots are going to be very, very happy because apparently Daniels will fall to them at number three and that's their game plan. And given that uh, Belichick is now out of there and they have a new coaching staff and everything else, I think it's a good time for a young quarterback to get in there with the changing of the guard. So I think this is going to be a good fit for him. Jones is out. Uh, the fan base was against him. There's your fiery quarterback, by the way, that did not work out very well. I think he'll be a breath of fresh air. But again, it's one of those things. You got to have somebody else as a veteran start for a little while and get this guy slow reps. I wouldn't be putting him in the game one for sure. I am not 100% sure that they're not going to take J.J. McCarthy. Um, I don't have a good enough handle on what the Patriots will want to do offensively, but McCarthy has sort of worked his way up the board. And what's been holding him back is that Michigan just did not need him. <laughs> they were primarily a running team, primarily a defensive team. It looks like nine of the guys that played for Michigan last year on the defensive side of the ball are probably going to get drafted, right? So the question is, was McCarthy not that important in the offense because he wasn't, the coaches didn't trust him to be that important, or did they just simply not need him? I think it's more of the latter. And I think that as a prototypical pocket quarterback, 
McCarthy is probably the best thing in the draft this year. As a guy that you can just plug in and say, he's run a pro offense. He's faced a lot of really strong defenses and he's going to be satisfied playing that sort of dink and dunk management game. If that's the way the Patriots want to go and you can play him right off the bat. Can you do that with Jalen Daniels? No, you can't. That's nothing against Jalen Daniels. He needs a year or two of seasoning probably, but are the Patriots in a situation where they can take a quarterback and then put him on the bench for a year or two? I don't know, especially with a new, a new coaching staff. You probably want a guy that you can plug in right away. Right. And so I think there's a pretty good chance that McCarthy goes third overall. I, I, I would put it at 50, 50 at this point. So let me ask you this, riddle me this Riddler. So given the Michigan connection and everything else and how well the team played, unfortunately, how they got bounced out by a little bit of bonehead decisions in the playoffs, which we saw that in the Super Bowl as well. But if the Detroit Lions start opening day with J.J. McCarthy, their quarterback and Jared Goff is gone and he's off to the commanders, hypothetically, how shocked would you be? I would be pretty surprised. I, I think the Lions are pretty pretty happy with what they have right now. You know, if you could swing a deal where you ended up with the third overall pick and you got golf and the whatever number pick the Lions have and something else, do you do that? I think you do do that if you're not the Lions and you just made a huge step forward last year. And I think you're probably the third or fourth best team. And I, I, I just don't know that you tear up the team that way. Right? I don't know if you do that. Um, from a standpoint of acquiring picks and getting better in the long term, I agree with that deal. But in the short term, boy, oh boy, if, if McCarthy comes in and 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 or, or whoever you draft, it comes if, in if and McCarthy becomes, or bust because of the yeah. Michigan connection. But yeah, you think? But I mean, like if McCarthy comes in and struggles and tanks your season, man alive, are you and that you you've basically lit your own pants on fire by making that move as a GM, right? If I'm golf, I'm liking my situation with the Lions a lot. I was yeah. clearly a good marriage, a good fit after, you know, with the Rams. And if I'm him, I want to stay put. I don't want to go to the Commanders. I don't see that being a good fit for him. I don't see a good fit for anybody with the Commanders until they get themselves squared away. But I was really shocked. And when I read it, I thought the deal was actually done. I said, you got to be joking me. I know that the playoffs didn't end up going well, but they did make the playoffs and they were strong. And if, if for some better in-game management, I think they could have gone a lot farther. I mean, this year with golf, people are saying there's still potential Super Bowl picks. So when you have a chance to get to the Super Bowl, you don't tank yourself. So unless you're literally drafting who you think is the next Tom Brady, I don't see that happening as well. Uh, at number four, I, I'm, I'm going to be... Uh, uh, a little bit of uh, breaking up the mold here because a lot of uh, the uh, experts are thinking the Cardinals are going to walk away with Marv Marvin Harrison Jr. at wide receiver at number four, and we're going to break up the quarterbacks for one pick until the Vikings swoop in at number five and guaranteed are taking J.J. McCarthy. So let's start off Marvin Harrison. Uh, given what the Cardinals need and where their team is at, and they're still sticking with Kyler Murray, I think this is a no-brainer for them. You can't get another quarterback again, and with all that no, dead you money can't, and everything you else, can't, you, got you can't get another quarterback. Sorry, <clears throat> you can't get another quarterback. But what you can do, let's say that the first three picks are Williams, May, and McCarthy. Okay. Now the Minnesota Vikings are what do we do they may give you another first or a, a, a whatever right to keep you from trading the fourth pick back to somebody else whether it be las vegas or somebody like that right to be able to pick up jalen daniels because now you put yourself in a position as minnesota where although i'm a big believer in sam darnold i think people are going to be happy You've set yourself up by letting Cousins go to get a young quarterback. And if those three go first and Daniels is still available or the other way around, everybody's thinking Arizona is not going to take a quarterback and they're not going to take a quarterback. But there's still going to be one of those guys, Daniels, May, or 
McCarthy on the board. And now Arizona can really turn the screws and say, hey, we're not going to take that guy, but we're going to make it so you're not going to take that guy either. We're going to trade that pick down and get a boatload for him. What can Arizona do then? Well, they can swap with Minnesota, pick up an extra pick or two, and still get Marvin Harrison. Or they can swap with somebody farther down. And I don't believe there's as huge of a gap between the other wide receivers like Malik Neighbors or uh, Odunza, either one of those guys. If you take any of those three, you're going to be happy. And you can get one of them at six, at eight, whatever, right? So do I believe if they're stuck at four, they're taking Harrison? Yeah, I think they're taking Harrison. But I think somebody is going to make them some sort of crazy offer to move up a few spots or from way back, you know, whether it be Las Vegas or somebody like that, to to get whatever guy is left at the fourth, at the fourth spot. If somebody really likes Jalen Daniels, if somebody really likes JJ McCarthy, I think the 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 Cardinals are going to be open to making that move. And if they don't get Marvin Harrison, they will be able to get one of those two other guys. And those guys would be number one receivers in any other year. You've got three guys who could be the number one overall receiver in most years. So reading, let's say, top five experts on uh, the NFL, all seem convinced the Vikings are trading up into the top five and they're walking away the quarterback. If, let's say, the Raiders come in and swoop in and take number four and all top four picks are quarterbacks and everybody's gone, including McCarthy, including Daniels, Vikings ain't trading for the number five pick unless they know which quarterback is sitting there. It's going to be a contingent deal knowing you're going to be able to do that. I remember with the, uh, you know, um, back in the day of Mike Trout, you know, and the Yankees waiting and waiting to draft him. And the Angels had the pick right before or so. And who did they go and take? They took Mike Trout. So it's funny. You can hope a guy's going to fall to you, but all it takes is one team in front of you. And uh, I I don't know if it's going to be top top four all quarterbacks going. Uh, it should be very interesting regardless. It's a lot of – it's just interesting that I thought there'd be more – at least one of the major trades way in advance of the draft. It looks like it's not happening till actual draft day to, for, to see these trades going through. I think there is so much uncertainty in da- in Daniels, in in May, and McCarthy that I don't think anybody really feels comfortable right now. I think everybody's just thinking, I don't want to be the guy who makes the trade, moves up to three, to get Daniels or to get May or whoever. And then the guy gets a DUI between now and the, and the draft, right? Not that I'm saying that would happen. Although that just did happen with one of the defensive tackles and his stock dropped out of the first round. Like, yeah, like how do you take that guy? Right? Seriously. Like maybe in the fourth round, you take him or something, but a guy who is probably a top 15 or 20 pick just got a DUI. And now it's like, and there were rumors before about he's not totally committed and everything else. So, I can see why people would keep, you know, keep that close to the vest. Um, but I, I think it, if you were going to say, okay, absolutely. What's going to happen here? No, no trades happening at all. Like what are the, what are the Vikings picking now? Fifth. I, I thought they were lower than that, but. Uh, oh, they're trading with Los Angeles as fifth. Right. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. It's cards. And I, the think, chargers. I think the chargers, I think the chargers are going to make, to deal that pick. And but is it going to be Minnesota? Do they feel like there's enough of a difference? To me, Minnesota's in a situation where they need a quarterback right now, and they need a guy to start right now. Are you in love with Jaden Daniels that you're going to let him work through whatever issues he has, or JJ McCarthy? If McCarthy falls to you and he's at five and you make that deal, I, like I said, I think he's probably ready to start. But if he's not, why would you not take either Michael Penix Jr. or Bo Nix, who are the two most quarter ready to start quarterbacks in this draft? And I think I think that actually Penix is going to be the most successful quarterback out of this draft. I really believe that. Now, will it be long term? Probably not. But over the course of the next two years, I think Penix is going to be really good. The problem is Penix is 25 already, right? Um, 
But I think if you're going to take a guy who can do everything that all of these other quarterbacks can do and possibly better, best arm strength of anybody in the in the draft, if you're Minnesota, why not wait around and take him longer a little later on? And le- I think the only guy that they really are going to wi- be willing to move up and take is McCarthy. I think that's the guy, right? If not, I think it's wait around and see what happens, and hopefully you get Penix. Stay tuned, folks. It's going to be a very, very interesting draft. We're all set to go for the NFL. And uh, as we're approaching uh, playoff season for the NHL and NBA here, and obviously baseball season is full swing. So next week, we're going to be looking at the NHL playoff picture and seeing now uh, who our predictions are and what is going to be happening in the world in the NHL. And I'm sure fans are going to love to comment on that. So send in your comments for the Chosen Life podcast. And we'll be back next week with Wayne Frazier, Wayne Frazier Jr. of Doug Laurie Sports. Uh, Wayne, any last uh, news items or tips on the world of memorabilia and sports Oh, uh, uh, I think probably the coolest thing that's happened in the last few days is I got a uh, a message from the granddaughter of the original Doug Laurie. And uh, they are downsizing a little bit. And they are going to get me a three-by-four-foot picture of Bobby Orr that used to hang behind the counter at the original Doug Glory Sports, uh, which is really cool. I'm really excited about that. So, and we may have some news hopefully by the next time we talk about whether we're moving the store or not. I'm still waiting to hear. Uh, we would be remaining in Barrie, but it's just a question of uh, whether the mall here can accommodate what I need or whether I have to move somewhere else. Stay tuned. It's always moving along in the world of sports. So stay tuned. We'll be back next week and we'll be talking about the NHL playoff picture.